So the number systems we've talked about so far are the natural numbers. So like your, your, like your whole numbers starting at zero, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Some people would say that zero is not a natural number. I disagree. Uh, integers are like your natural numbers plus like the negatives of all of those, zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, and so on. Uh, we've discussed fractions. Specifically in our context, we've only discussed fractions um, where uh, both of your numbers are uh, positive natural numbers. Um, of course, B can't be zero, but whatever. Um, and so today we're discussing a little bit of rational numbers. Rational numbers are just, we kind of combine the concepts of integers with fractions, um, where we have like negative numbers, and now we could just do fractions of negative numbers. And we, these are called rational numbers. Okay, so something like negative two over three, four over negative six, negative eight over negative two, these are all considered to be rational numbers. All right, um, and so the book, um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, 9.1. I don't think that there's like very much value in that section. Basically, it says like, oh, all of the stuff that we talked about with, uh, with integers and all of the stuff that we talked about with fractions are all both going to apply to uh, rational numbers. So, you know, when it comes to adding two negative numbers or multiplying two negative numbers. When you multiply two negatives, you get a positive. That applies to rational numbers as well. Uh, when you add a, uh, when you add two fractions, you have to find a common denominator. Same thing when you add two rational numbers, you have to find a common denominator. If you do negative two thirds plus five fourths, you're still gonna get a, need a common denominator of like 12, um, regardless of whether or not like either of those numbers are positive or negative, like all that stuff's just gonna kind of work out the same. There's nothing new and exciting happening with rational numbers. It's all just gonna be like, you know, your properties of fractions, your properties of integers, and just mesh them together. You get properties of rational numbers. So nothing new here. Um, so we're mostly just gonna skip this section. Uh, and the next number system we're gonna discuss is in 9.2, the real numbers, which is basically just everything else. So the book's definition of the real numbers is uh, numbers that have an infinite decimal expansion. So some examples of real numbers would be square root of two or pi, the negative of the square root of five, um, but like things like eight and negative two over four are also considered to be real numbers. Um, this is not a very good definition. Uh, it's not a very like mathematically precise definition. Um, and it's also a little bit confusing for some people because you have to consider like eight to have an infinite decimal expansion, emphasis on the word infinite. The infinite decimal expansion of eight is like 8.0 repeating, but no one would really think of eight as having an infinite decimal expansion. That's kind of why I think it's like a weird definition. Um, it's also not a mathematically precise definition. So this definition has some baggage. It's really, in my opinion, it's better to just think of the real numbers as everything else. Um, so if you're not going to be mathematically precise, why try? I don't know. Um, so anyway, um, so w with all of these number systems, you have sort of a hierarchy. So you have the real numbers, which just includes like pretty much all of the numbers. Uh, except for things like, uh, you know, square root of negative two. This is not a real number. This is something called a complex number. So maybe maybe up here you have the complex numbers, I guess, um, just above everything. Um, and then you have your rational numbers. Uh, you have your integers, your fractions, your naturals, and you have this whole hierarchy. So rationals basically combine the integers and the fractions. But integers contain things like negative two, which are not considered fractions, because fractions only consider uh, positive things, like positive two over positive three. It's considered a fraction, but it's not considered an integer. So both of these have things that don't show up in the in the other. But of course, they have some overlap, like the number five is in both of these sets. Uh, and then you have naturals all the way at the bottom. So naturals are like included in all of these other number sets. So this hierarchy is like kind of important to understand. Um, when it comes to the properties of like addition and multiplication, there is basically no difference in um, how those prop how those uh, properties end up shaking out. 
in any of these sets. So basically, like all of the properties of addition and multiplication are going to hold true for pretty much all of these sets. All right. So next thing I want to discuss is square roots. So the square root of a number a is defined to be the number x such that uh, x squared is equal to a. We also usually stipulate that x is going to be a non-negative number. So um, the square root of 4, we would say this is equal to 2. Since if you take the number 2 and square it, it's going to give you back the number 4. Um, and also, 2 is non-negative. So uh, if you were to take the number negative 2 and square that, you will still also get 4, positive 4 out. Uh, and so the number 4, it has uh, two square roots. Uh, and so we don't want to have two different possible answers when we take a square root. Uh, we want to have just one answer, and so it just is more natural to just take the positive of those two uh, of those two possible answers. And so that's why we kind of stipulate this here. All right. Uh, nth roots are very similar. Uh, the nth root of a number a, uh, we use uh, this symbol right here. Uh, this is kind of a weird symbol, and there's a little bit of baggage that comes along with the symbol, with, which I'll get to in a, in a little bit. But this is the symbol that we use to denote nth roots. Um, and it is defined to be the number x such that x to the power of n is equal to a. So for example, the cube root of 8 is equal to 2 because 2 to the power of 3 is equal to 8. Uh, one quirk about uh, cube roots versus square roots is that when you take um, a cube root of a number um, you don't get two answers. So negative two is not equal to the cube root of eight. Um, since if you were to take negative two and cube it, you would actually get negative eight. And so this actually, what this actually tells you, um, the fact that negative two cubed is equal to negative eight, um, this also tells you, we should duplicate this, this also tells you that you could take cube roots of negative numbers. Did not mean to have that. So the cube root of negative 8 is equal to negative 2 uh, because of this statement right here. So you can't, you can't like take the square root of a negative number and get a real number. You would have to get an imaginary or complex number. So this does not exist in the real numbers. Um, but you can take cube roots of negative numbers. And the same applies to like whenever n is like um, an even or an odd number. So even numbers and two behave the same way. Odd numbers and three all behave the same way. So all the discussion about two and three versus discussion about evens and odds um, nth roots is all kind of the same. And so a better definition for nth roots would be case by case. For um, even numbers, the nth root is equal to the number a such that x to the n equals a, blah, blah, blah. And we stipulate that x has to be non-negative. And then for odd numbers, we don't care. We just say this. All right. So um, rational exponents. Uh, basically, rational exponents are just different notation for nth roots. So there's literally no difference between um, writing the nth root of a and a to the 1 over n. Like these mean the exact same thing. The way that we define a to the 1 over n is we define it to be the number x such that x to the n is equal to a. The book's definition is literally just that a to the 1 over n is equal to the nth root of a, this like radical symbol. So effectively, there's like no reason to have this symbol. I've talked to other mathematicians that I've just said like this symbol here like is meaningless like compared to this like why do we have this symbol when we could just have this like just one over n as an exponent like if we just only taught it this way like there would no like people get confused when you say like that the square root of four is equal to four to the one half like that confuses people um unnecessarily but like if we just instead of teaching this symbol we just taught this symbol like people would learn it the same way and then they would also know that you can apply exponent rules to this stuff so there's a little bit to 
to say there. So anyway, um, it's not really worth like getting upset about or whatever. Like you have to learn what the what all of these symbols mean anyway. But um, effectively, there's there's like no reason to have this symbol. These mean the exact same thing. Um, so anyway. Let's just compute a couple things. So 16 to the 1 fourth, what does this mean? So this is equal to 2. Um, and why is it equal to 2? It's equal to 2 since 2 to the 4th is equal to 16. Um, and so we can now apply um, <clears throat> uh, laws of uh, exponents to extend, like extend our nth roots to um, just like any, um, like any rational exponent. So 27 to the 2 thirds, what this really means is 27 to the 1 third squared. So I'm like using an exponent rule here. So this is like um, easier to deal with because uh, 27 to the 1 third, that's equal to 3 because 3 cubed is equal to 27. And so that to the power of 2 is just equal to 9. So we can actually like make sense of like what this value means. Right, uh, and so, um, so yeah, if you were to do like twenty-seven to the one-third um, and square it, you'd basically have this. So that's twenty-seven to the one-third plus one-third, or twenty-seven to the two-thirds. Basically, what you can see here with all of this is that um, all of these, uh, all of our exponent rules that we uh, have been using so far and learning so far, they also apply to um, rational exponents. So um, if I were to do something like 2 to the 3 halves times 2 to the 5 halves all to the 1 fourth power, I can just deal with this in the same way that I would deal with if these were just like all whole numbers. So when you multiply um, a to the m times a to the n, uh, you're going to get a to the m plus n. So over here, this should be equal to 2 to the 3 halves plus 5 halves. And that is equal to 2 to the 8 halves. And 8 halves is equal to 4, so this is equal to 2 to the 4th, all to the 1 fourth power. And that is equal to 2 to the 4 over 4, which is just equal to 2. By the way, this is part of the reason why uh, we write like 2 to the 1 fourth, um, like why like the fourth root of 2, we write it as 2 to the 1 fourth, because if you were to take 2 to the 1 fourth and raise it to the power of 4, you should just get back to where you started. In the same way that if you took the square root of 2 and squared that, it's like 2 to the 1 half, square that, you're just going to get back to 2. So take the square root and then square it, you get back to where you started. And this lines up with how our exponent rules work. You get 2 to the 4 over 4, which is equal to 2 to the 1, or just 2. So um, yeah, it just kind of works out really nicely in that way. All right. So yeah, that's it.